Hi guys, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Deputy Aaron Brobeck, Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office. Uh, personal note, I wanted to thank you guys for all the compassion that you guys showed us yesterday. Um, it's a tough time. Uh, the way this is going to kind of work out today is uh, the sheriff's going to come up. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, um, both deputies, as much as he can talk about the case, and then we're going to have Oklahoma City Police Department come up and talk about their investigation into the case and then take questions from there if you guys have any questions. So, Sheriff, come on up. <clears throat> you know, I, I love our media partners, but uh, today really isn't the, the day I would really enjoy seeing you guys. Um, it, it's, it's, it's tough. It's been tough for our Sheriff's Office family. Um, everybody's feeling it. You know, I'm going to get into why we were there, like Aaron said, and then Oklahoma City is doing the investigation for us, and we are so grateful for that because um, when you're involved in something like this, it just it really takes a toll, and it's hard to get back to that zero to be able to perform the investigation and give it the attention and detail that is very necessary, that it, you know it, that specific incident is duly owed. So we are grateful for Oklahoma City and their partnership in this um, incident. So my deputies... Mark Johns and Deputy Robert Swartz went to this house to serve eviction papers. Apparently they had uh, a suspect who was uncooperative at the beginning, went to the back door. Uh, Deputy Swartz went to the back door and as he got to the back door that is when the shot started hitting him multiple times. Deputy Mark Johns being there went to assist and uh, went to get in between and rescue his friend, went to rescue his deputy um, to save him. And uh, I mean, I just, I think that's a true testament to what we have here at the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office, just a real team, real family. Um, because I mean, I just think that's a tremendous sacrifice to do for anyone and we gladly do it for our public and we do it for our family that we have here at the Sheriff's Office. Um, tough day. I got a couple reached out to the family and asked them what they would like to say or what they would like me to say about Deputy Johns and Deputy Swartz and starting with Mark Johns family they want to let people know that he has completed surgery and that he has started the healing process. He was hit multiple times, had shrapnel in his body, they removed the shrapnel he and, uh, some of the shrapnel hit his femoral artery. Um, obviously it was touch and go, but we're glad he's stable. Um, I just left his bedside and he's in great condition. Um, he is peppy and, um, you know, he's in good spirits and I'm glad to see that. They want family, friends, and the community to know that they are grateful for all the support that they are receiving. Lastly, they want the law enforcement community to know that they love and appreciate them very much. They ask that you continue to pray for Deputy Mark Johns and a, have a successful recovery. Um, that touches on another topic that I am so passionate about. I tell you all how close this law enforcement community we have here in Oklahoma is. And if that is not evident, when you look at that video of the pursuit, you see guys coming from all over to help our guys out. That means the world to me. That meant the absolute world to me, and I cannot be more grateful for that. Robert Swartz's family wanted to convey, they wanted to let people know that he was a good man, an even better dad, and the world's greatest granddad. His grandkids called him Papa Policeman. What a name. And he never missed a soccer game. Another point I'd like to touch on, this job is very stressful, very dynamic presents us with a lot of tough times, yet we still got to go home to families too. And he was able to make all those grandkids game to be a great dad. Um, I just really think that's a true testament to who he was as a person. Um, and I also want to give you a scripture, John 15, 13. There is no greater love than to lay one life down for one's friend. I think that is so appropriate my deputies were ready to lay their lives down for each other and for this community. And I want the community to know that that is beyond words powerful. Um, and and I, I can't, um, I just can't express my appreciation enough. 
give you some statistics for Deputy Robert Swartz. He started as a reserve deputy, full-time assigned to the jail division, December 1997. He was in records and warrants division, trans, uh, transferred to transportation division, then to the juvenile center. He went to the patrol division, and then where he was in civil and extraditions. Mark John stats as a deputy here at the sheriff's office. He started as a reserve deputy, moved to a full-time assigned to the jail division, December 1991, the patrol division, the motors unit, sergeant in the investigations division, retired after 25 years of service, December 2016, came back as a reserve deputy in 2021, and then hired back full-time assigned to the civil division, January 2022. So you're talking about a lifetime of dedicated service to this community and to the sheriff's office. I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, and these guys, uh, all the honor that is given to them in this tough time, they are worthy of that praise. Um, so with that, I will give the floor to Oklahoma City. I'm so gracious that Chief Wade Gourley could show up today and provide you with the updates. Is, sorry, small question. How do you spell John's J-O-H-N-S? Yes, ma'am. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I want to start by offering from the Oklahoma City Police Department and uh, on behalf of myself as well, our condolences and prayers to the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office. Um, just a, a tragic day uh, for them and, and they need all the prayers and support they can get. And that's what we intend to do uh, as a department is to support them and, and help them through this. Um, as uh, Sheriff Johnson said, we are uh, working the investigation um, on the incident that happened out there, which is, is pretty normal for these type of things when it occurs in our city limits. And I'll tell you too that these partnerships and the way that we work together, this didn't develop yesterday uh, or the day before. Um, these, these are things that at the moment he was elected, he and I meet regularly. Uh, we talk about things as leaders and how we handle things within our organization. So uh, this was just a natural process for us uh, during this event to step up and, and uh, uh, meet the challenge and work together to make sure everybody's needs are met and supported throughout this. And so um, that's what we intend to do and, and work this investigation in a professional manner. I will tell you that uh, the information that I have for you today is preliminary, um, but I felt like we needed to put together as much as we could to let you know what we know now. Uh, this isn't everything and this information could definitely change. We're in the very early stages of this investigation. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts to it, um, a lot of physical evidence, a lot of things that have to be uh, worked through. And so as part of that, uh, I just want you to know that this, is, this information that I'll give you is the best that we have right now. And so I'll just kind of start with a timeline um, that uh, uh, kind of walk you through what happened. On uh, August 22nd, at about 9.53 in the morning, we received a call, our agency received a call uh, to the 2200 block of Southwest 78th and it was for eviction help. Uh, Oklahoma City police officers do not serve civil papers, do not get involved in evictions, so our officers explain that very thoroughly to the reporting party um, and what the next steps needed to be and kind of advised her and how to walk through that process. Um, once they did that, then that's when the incident was turned over to the sheriff's office and then they ended up making a response out there. And in that initial call, the mother had called in, said her son was acting up, placing things in the driveway. She'd been working on eviction and VPO paperwork prior to this. She was advised to get the, uh, again, to get the eviction paperwork together and advised to contact the sheriff's office since the, the uh, property resided in Oklahoma County. Um, we were not able to verify a VPO at that time. The officers, the information that they got was that the VPO at that point had not uh, something wasn't right with it and, it and it wasn't showing up as valid. We don't know. We'll look into that and see why that determination was made or if that's actually the facts, but that's the facts the officers had at the time. At about 1.18 p.m., um, neighbors started calling in, started calling 911 on shots fired at that location. One of our officers happened to be with a county sheriff employee who had his radio on and was hearing the radio traffic and relayed that to our officers that uh, this was actually a shooting involving Oklahoma County Sheriff's deputies. Um, uh, we started uh, to the scene and our first officer arrived on scene at about 1.22 p.m. 
um, started rendering aid. He got to the backyard, found the two deputies um, that had been shot and started rendering aid to them uh, and calling for medical help and getting all of that, that started. Uh, the suspect was uh, not there at the time. Um, the officers cleared the house and, and began looking in the area and they got information that he had left and they had a description of his vehicle. So our helicopter went airborne at about 1.24 p.m. Um, again, medical efforts continue on the two deputies and uh, um, one of the supervisors on the scene requested our helicopter to land to try and get the, one of the deputies to the hospital as quickly as they could. Um, but when our aircraft landed, they realized that there was a lot more to that and our aircraft was not equipped to make that transport and so we couldn't, we couldn't do it, we couldn't make it work. They were just trying to do what they can to, to speed that up and get them to the hospital as quickly as they could. At about 1.33 p.m., one of our officers spotted uh, the suspect vehicle near Southwest 89th and Walker radioed that that, uh, that information and, and began waiting on officers to get there, but the suspect took off, started a pursuit. At about 1.36 p.m., the suspect entered northbound I-35 from Southeast 89th Street. Uh, again, at that point, several more officers started arriving on scene. One of our officers tried to disable the vehicle, tried to ram it, but as you saw yesterday, he was pulling a boat which made it very difficult, if not almost impossible to do that, but they were trying to do everything they could to stop him because um, of the danger that he posed to the public at that point, because he'd obviously already shot two law enforcement officers, so we knew at that point um, that no one was gonna be safe from him and that he was gonna be very desperate and would probably continue those actions. At about 1.39 p.m., the suspect fired rounds at the pursuing officers. This was at I-35 and approximately Southeast 44th Street. Just a few seconds later, still at 139, but probably about 50 or so seconds later, uh, the suspect fired again, just north of Grand Boulevard. One of our officers was uh, stationary just after that in the uh, 2500 block of southbound I-35 on the inside shoulder. And he fired at the suspect who was northbound attempting to stop the pursuit and stop the deadly threat since he had already shot at the officers. And at the same time, uh, another officer was, was able to get close enough to the vehicle and also try to stop the suspect and fired rounds at him as well. So we had two officers that fired return fire at the suspect. And this occurred, uh, the second uh, officer firing occurred somewhere around Southeast 15th Street, we think in that area. The pursuit then continued east on I-40 at high speeds. Uh, the suspect exited at Air Depot and drove to the Tinker Air Force Base gate where, as you saw in the video, he was holding the rifle out of the window um, and he basically gave up at the gate, uh, but he was not cooperating and had to be tackled to the ground and taken into custody. Uh, the suspect was also tased at that point to gain cooperation and placed in handcuffs. Uh, he did sustain a, uh, uh, an injury and was taken to a local hospital and treated for that injury and, and was released um, at the hospital and booked into the county jail. So again, that's just a basic overview there um, of what occurred and I was very encouraged to hear the sheriff say too that uh, his, his deputy is out of surgery and so we pray for a speedy recovery for him and we also pray for the family of the fallen deputy and, and uh, again, the agency as a whole. Uh, we do have we looked and we had a, um, five prior calls to this address on 78th within the last year. All of those were like disturbance type calls that were dispositioned as um, civil matters and uh, pr uh, ultimately led to probably what occurred yesterday with the eviction and trying to get that taken care of. So with that, um, we are working on getting information as to where and when the firearms were purchased. We don't have that yet, that takes a little legwork and we have to work with uh, some of our federal partners to get that information. So we are working on that. I know that's always a question that comes up and uh, um, we're, we're gonna work to, to find that out. Obviously it is important to this case. So with that, uh, I'll answer any questions you may have of me regarding the investigation. I have a question yes. about the guns. Yeah. Um, I know you all are looking into that. According to the BPO that was filed, on August 11th, and it said that it was served to him on the 12th, 
it said that all of his weapons were to be taken by Oklahoma City Police. Um, did that happen, and how was he able to get a hold of weapons if that did happen? I, I don't know yet, and it's still early uh, in the investigation. Again, the information that we, ha we had when we went out there showed that the VPO hadn't been served. We don't serve VPOs, um, so I'm not sure how that information was relayed and what you know happened in that incident um, but, but that'll be something that we'll look at as part of the investigation for sure. Chief why do we think the suspect went to Tinker? Did he just make a wrong turn or? Really have no idea um, uh, you know I, I couldn't tell you I mean it's obvious you know he's a very desperate individual and, and I have no idea why he would do that I mean I've, I asked that question too of myself I just I couldn't figure that out. Um, more so a question for Sheriff Johnson. Uh, what protective vests were the deputies wearing yesterday and did the bullet penetrate those vests? Uh, just your, your standard everyday issued ballistic vest. Um, obviously a model like what I'm wearing here. Um, but when you're talking about two, two, three, five, five, six rounds, it just turns into shrapnel and still has enough power to even go through these. So um, it, it's, they were both wearing vests, just to answer that question. But, but yes, it was still able to penetrate. Well, I mean, if, if you ever get familiar with vests and you look at what our military uses, they use a rifle rated vest. Those are very heavy for everyday use and um, extremely expensive. Um, you know, these models right here run about a thousand a unit. Those models run about three thousand a unit. Um, and like I said, they're extremely heavy. And I don't think that, you know, our deputies would be able to be as mobile with them and uh, it wouldn't be as user friendly as these are. And these units are brand new. We just got these how long ago? I don't know, maybe seven, eight months. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sure, can you talk about what it was like coming into work today? It's it's extremely difficult. Um you know, I got really emotional yesterday, and I apologize for that. I really try to keep it together, um, especially for my community, and, and I know they, they look at the leader to be strong. But when you walk into a hospital, and, and one, I will tell you this, every one of my staff were involved in that pursuit to, you know, just try to get justice for our guys, every last one of us. And, and from the, everywhere across this agency, we just want a vindication. Um, but when you walk into the hospital, and you see one deputy being worked on, and clearly he's in bad shape. Um, and so their room's blocked off, so you go into your other deputy's room to check on him and see how he's doing. And he says, Sheriff, you're here. It, it, was, it was beyond the weirdest feeling moment I've ever had in my life. He grabs my hand and he tells me, sir, I couldn't save him. I'm sorry. He has taken ownership of this um, and so when you see that when you see the men and women you serve that I so thankfully serve and I'm grateful um, when you see them break down like that and it hurts like that um, and I love all my folks I do it's a very difficult thing that I don't think you can put in words and so it's it's tough and today is tough um, you know you you try to get back to square one where you can start making decisions because we still have to run an agency. We still have to plan for a funeral. We still have a deputy in the hospital worried about his well-being. And so there's just a lot there. But I will tell you, um, when you can lean on men like Wade Gorley, like J.D. Younger, like Todd Gibson, you know, like everybody that reached out to me, Nathaniel Tarver, Rick Jackson, they all reached out. I mean, I, I, there's so many agencies I can't. I can't even name them all, but when they all reach out and say, hey, we're here for you, and they start saying, hey, you, you, you need to think about this, or you need to think about that, that really is what makes it doable, because you have other guys that understand where you're at and are willing to carry that load for you. Obviously, the, the trauma that this is for this agency, mm -hmm. what, what type of support have you guys received, uh, only from the wellness unit from your local city Oh, Police my Department? goodness. When you talk about the wellness unit from Oklahoma City Police Department, um, I don't think you can find the words that, that have enough um, weight behind them. They come in, clearly everybody's rattled. And they come in, they level everybody out, they start working, they start doing things. Um, they start putting things into motion that we're not even thinking about. Um, 
and, and just, you know, working alongside the administration and with the deputies involved, um, they really, they really made this process much, much, I don't want to say easier because that's not the word, but much more doable. Um, because we were we were in a we were in a very sad way, so we were very grateful for Oklahoma City and the Wellness Department for coming out, and they're in constant contact. They're helping us with the funeral. They're helping us um, with our deputy who's still in the hospital, and then with just the well-being of all of our deputies that were involved or close to. So um, it's it's I think this partnership has has been very beneficial in many areas. I think that's a great question. What was the uh, suspect saying when deputies arrived at the home? He was refusing to come out. Ma'am, I don't know. I don't know. How was the third deputy? Wasn't there a third deputy? There was there? a third deputy. Um, how were they? She is shaken up, as you can imagine. Um, taking her time off. Um, I, I, um, and since it's involved in the investigation, I really can't speak too, too much into that. Um, but, but she's OK. And so you guys have mentioned um, not only yesterday, but just now that this other deputy, Johns, tried to save Bobby. And so how exactly did he try and save him? When you get into what we call the fatal funnel in law enforcement, which is the doorway, um, and Deputy Swartz got hit and went down, he tried to get on top of him and pull him out of the way. What a courageous act. Like I said, to give your own life for, for your friends, so courageous jumped down to get and pull him out the way. And then that time he got hit himself. And so, uh, so the the truly a hero. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I would, I would like to add just one thing real quick on that. Um, there, there was plenty of information yesterday uh, inside that home that and I won't go into a lot of detail of it, but I could tell you with 100% confidence, um, he was planning on killing any law enforcement that came to his house. 100%. Uh, it wouldn't have mattered what uniform you wore that day if you were law enforcement. That's that's was that was his plan. And when uh, we searched the vehicle uh, when the when the pursuit was over, um, there was a bag found uh, in, inside the uh, boat. And in that bag, there were multiple firearms and lots of ammunition. Um, he, was, he was definitely ready for a confrontation. So we're very blessed that it, you know, you asked the question why he pulled into Tinker. I don't know, but I'm very thankful and grateful that it ended the way it did. And we didn't get, get more officers hurt because it definitely could have ended a lot worse. But I just want to be very clear that, that what he did yesterday was, was very well planned out. Um, and, uh, you know, very cowardly. Those officers didn't have a chance. And uh, um, it was, uh, there was definitely, that was his intention, was to kill those police officers. And no one else was inside the home with him at the time? Not that we're aware of. We're still, again, talking to him and talking to others that are, you know, uh, that, were, that were involved in the initial calls and other things there too. But as far as we know, it was just him. Whose home was it? Was it his girlfriend's or mother's or whose was it? I really don't know. I believe. Yeah. The call that came in, it was from his mother, though, right? Yeah, I mean, it, speculation would be her home. She was trying to evict him, but I, I don't know for sure if that's the case. Was that the suspect's truck and boat? That he, was that his, his, or did he steal it? We believe it was his, because um, he left in it from the residence. And he has no prior uh, offenses other than traffic tickets? The only thing we had as far as prior criminal contact was a uh, uh, 2006, we had contact with him for illegal dumping of trash. Then how did that instance go? If you can recall, I know it was back in 2006, but. Normally on a deal like that, someone calls in and, and we issue a citation and that's normally how that, how that goes. But I, I don't recall it in looking at the previous incident that there were any issues involved in that arrest or anything. I, I don't know. Um, again, that'll be part of the investigation that they'll they'll look at. I know our investigators talked to him uh, yesterday, and then those initial officers had contact, but we'll have to review all that and make that determination. So aside from the beautiful memorial that is sitting outside, is there anything else that either department plans on doing for Bobby's family? 
Um, we're going to have the funeral. It'll be Friday. That will be announced uh, once everything is solidified. Um, I'll tell you our community partners. I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, Committee 100. They have already showed up and, and really um, been gracious to, to the families, um, showed their support, their love and support, um, and just and several other entities like them. And so I, what you're seeing here is truly that community law enforcement relationship that is often said doesn't exist, but it clearly exists because when we are hurting, I mean, there there's people coming from everywhere and not just this state, it's our nationwide that are reaching out and showing support and seeing how they can help um, both of the families involved. Sheriff, some, some broadcast reports were saying that your deputies are already under fire from the garage in the in the front of the house. Is that is that true or was the only time they took fire was when they were around behind? Them? And so what's going to happen is once the completion of the investigation um, is, well, once the investigation is completed, my apologies, um, we will get briefed on all of that, but we really have to wait and let the investigation run its course. So that's speculation? It's all speculation. All right. Because, I mean, we weren't there. Chief, what was the, what was the weapon that was recovered once you finally cornered Plank out of the, out of the okay, out of there were several. Um, he had several handguns. He had a, uh, a rifle, um, and so yeah, there were. He had several handguns. Right, the rifle he had in in the cab. What what was that rifle? I don't know what what kind it is. Again, that the way the way those things go on that is, those are left at the scene, and our CSI goes out and collects those, and then all of that data will be you know put together as part of the investigation and and part of that too will be was that you know we we'll want to find out if that was the rifle that was used to shoot the deputies or you know or what what occurred in that so it's all part of that process and so i won't have anything to do with that until they get done processing Our leaders that. are asking questions about about policy of, of firing and a moving vehicle uh, of course that's it that's uh, that gets wrangled around in every city um, uh, what is what is Oklahoma City Police Department's policy uh, of, of firing at a moving vehicle? We we have a pretty strict policy on firing at a moving vehicle. For example, if 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 you're just firing at the vehicle itself, um, you know, to stop it from rolling at you or something like that, we have a pretty clear policy that addresses that. This was very different because you had a suspect driving in the community along a very occupied interstate that is firing his weapon and is a, a threat to the public. So at that point, uh, those officers are authorized to shoot at that vehicle and at that individual to try and stop the threat. Is that, is that where those two bullet holes came, came from that some helicopter shots showed in the front windshield? Your stationary officer fired into that cab try, just, just trying to stop stop the chase from going on. We, we don't know. Um, that'll be part, that definitely is going to be part of the investigation. And again, that's, that's why our crime scene investigators go out there and collect the evidence and, and uh, we'll make that determination, you know, once we know uh, more about the, more about after we've processed that vehicle. Uh, no, I, I, I can tell you he did speak with our detectives, but um, that's all part of the investigation right now that we're still placing it all together to help us help us again figure out what happened and, and hopefully figure out a why. So he spoke to you all and didn't, did he request an attorney at any point in time? I don't know if he did or not, but I do know he, he spoke with the officers on the scene and uh, um, also our investigators. Was there consideration at any point to terminate the pursuit? No, um, you really can't. I mean, again, you've got a subject that's actively shooting. He's already killed or, you know, one police officer and shot at another and then shot at our police officers too. So we, we really don't have a choice at that point. We've got to continue and stay in that chase because if he stops and, you know, continues that, uh, that harm to the public, we have to be there and be ready when that happens. This is a deadly force situation at that point. Um, we did recently, when we upgraded uh, or updated our pursuit policy, we did incorporate tactical vehicle interventions. So we have some of our officers now that are trained that. We're working to get more. 
Um, but uh, at that point, you know, again, this is deadly force uh, is authorized. So if, if they ram or try to do anything to stop that threat, that's, that's what they're trying to do, and they're justified in doing that. So, Chief, to, clar to clarify here, I just, I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, normally, your officers are not allowed to fire a moving vehicle, but in this kind of extreme situation, they, they do have the discretion uh, in, in order to just stop the situation, try, just tr to try and intervene and stop it, right? Yes, especially when they're being fired upon. Right. So, okay. um, so, yeah, we, we do have a uh, pretty strict policy and, a, you know, a procedure regarding that. And, um, but this, the circumstances of this incident, um, they are authorized to fire into that vehicle. Did the stationary officers, were they using a rifle or a handgun? You know, I don't know. Uh, oh, they were using a rifle. Um, I know it's been, so, it's been quite some time since an Oklahoma County deputy has been shot and killed. Um, when it comes to an investigation like this, how long do you expect the threat to typically take? I couldn't put a time frame on it, and I, to be honest, I don't want to. I want them to, I want them to do it right. I want them to be very thorough, and uh, um, I always tell our investigators in these any of these cases, not any of them that we have, especially when they're they're complex because of how much evidence and things that you have. That I, I I'm never going to ask them how much longer you're going to be, or you know, I'm not going to put any pressure on them for that because uh, they're very good at what they do. I want them to do a very thorough job. Uh, and, you know, we owe it to, to the deputy and to the agency and to the family to make sure that we do it right. So I, I couldn't give you a time frame. Thank you so much. Chief, you said he planned this. Um, did he know it was going to happen yesterday morning? I don't know that he did. Um, and I can't go into a lot of detail except just to say that, you know, there was evidence inside this home that, that truly indicated he was, he was ready for, uh, for what he did. And, I would obviously say he planned it because of the way it went down. Thank you guys for bringing that. I appreciate you. Thanks, everyone.